So I was going to call my talk Know Your Unknowns, and uh, specifically unknown software. How do we analyze? How do we like detect what it's doing? Uh, but then after Alex's talk, I was like sitting at the audience, and I'm like, damn, maybe I should just call it Let It Run Free. You know, forget emulators, forget everything. Just let malware run free and just try to analyze it using the simplest forms possible kind of like Occam's Razor. Uh, don't go crazy into emulators because people like Alex will exploit them, but rather go and uh, provide the most natural habitat, so to speak, that the malware could you know, proliferate and thrive in, and just inspect what it's doing. Now, the uh, idea is that there is many, many techniques and methods to do so, as well as tools to do so, and so I've decided uh, to show you kind of like a, a uh, cursory glance at all of them and then specifically focus on specific tools that you may or may not know. And the other thing is I'm focusing on the other non-Windows operating systems because he was all into Windows. Uh, I'm of the opinion that Windows is a dying breed. So we're specifically, we're going to talk about Mac OS, iOS, Linux, and Android, which are all so very similar that the tools actually would work in both. So mission statement or problem statement is this. We've got a new software sample. Now, it may or may not be malware. It's just basically software you want to reverse. And uh, you want to basically answer three questions. The first is, what does this software do? Second is, uh, not so trivial a question, how does it do it? Uh, there's many ways of achieving any type of functionality, whether it's calling a syscall, whether it's like going to some device driver and calling some unknown IOCTOL, maybe if it's uh, some service over XPC that you're uh, using. So in many ways, uh, you're not just asking what does the software do, but also you want to get the exact vector of operation, how it's doing it, which APIs it's using, and so forth. And last but not least, since we are dealing with malware in uh, our little uh, conference here, uh, is it a threat? Is it a benign piece of software? Is it a, an actual something that's potentially malicious? And this is where I believe that if you let it run in the most unconfined way possible, then there's the advantage that all of the heuristics and uh, trying to detect emulators simply would just not be applicable here because you're looking at a system that you are willing to sacrifice the bare bones of. You are willing to sacrifice like an actual Mac machine that you'll compromise for this or some Android device or some iOS device, jailbroken or not. That's a different discussion, but basically once you do that, the malware, most of its checks and heuristics will just say, oh, I'm running on like a real system, so let's just go ahead and do what I do best, which is in fact. So there's two approaches basically, and the way I'm going to drill down is I'm going to show you like how normally one would analyze, and then we have to do this dichotomy between static analysis and dynamic analysis. Static I'm only going to touch on very briefly. And then I'm going to talk about the dynamic analysis methods. So static analysis is actually, in my humble opinion, the only true way to go. Because at the end of the day, no matter what, the malware has to be uh, comprehensible to the CPU. And if it's comprehensible to the CPU, then it's also comprehensible to your disassembler. Of course, there are challenges with static analysis, primarily the fact that most people don't read assembly, or even if they do read assembly, they'd rather not be reading assembly. Uh, and so basically, also there's also a bunch of dialects of assembly, so ARMv7, ARMv8, and uh, you know Intel, for those of us like Alex who still cling to Windows. Uh, so basically, there's just so many variants that it's really uh, a difficult, uh, you know, difficult ex expertise to gain and to get to the point where you're fine with that. Now, there are decompilers. Uh, Ida has a bunch of decompilers, modules for their own a disassembler, I've seen that they're fairly weak, and I've seen that there, uh, in many cases, there's there's like issues with them. So that's number one that you need a high barrier to entry. You need like the significant lead or reverse engineering skills, and of course, the process itself may be very very time consuming, and of course, any proper malware, and I say malware, that's like I would say medium grade or higher it would probably obfuscate itself, which of course would be a pain in the butt because then you'd be looking at all sorts of like loops or LLVM disassembler and uh, I mean LLVM, sorry, uh, um, there's a, the LLVM obfuscator that you can use in order to compile your code in like spaghetti loops, so it becomes pretty challenging. So that leaves us with dynamic analysis, which is my focus here, which is often a far, far simpler approach than any of this because again, the idea is that you're letting the software run and then it only boils down to how well you can monitor what it's doing. And it's so much easier because basically, like I said, all you need is a machine, uh, preferably not a virtual machine because of all those blue pill, red pills, and other idiosyncrasies or other behaviors that may be detected. However, there are some risks. And you know, I got to first start with the disclaimer. And uh, I'll get to that and, and tell you that 
that is a potentially risky approach. I mean, it could go haywire. But before we do that, let's just talk in, in basic stuff about uh, static analysis. Uh, most of the, I would say, amateur malware, not the ones that you find that are weapons grade, but most of the basic malware, they make no attempt whatsoever to obfuscate themselves. And then a simple string analysis uh, will get you a, a long way. Uh, and this would be something that it can either be analysis of its strings it's in its import tables, what you would do with NM, or like J2 minus big S, uh, capital S, or just running the strings command. And uh, I've seen in many cases that, you know, it's really surprising just how many hard-coded strings you get, and these could be hard-coded URLs of where it's going to and so forth, or it could be like all sorts of uh, specific functions where, for example, if it's opening something and calling connect, then you know it's got TCP connectivity. If it's calling uh, IO connect, then you know it's got IOKit connectivity in, in Mac OS where it means it's going to some type of kernel driver and so forth. So that's a simple approach which I think as you try to analyze some unknown piece of software, it's always nice to still try the low-hanging fruit because you might be pleasantly surprised. However, therein lies the problem that, like I said, anywhere from medium grade and higher, you see that there's all sorts of attempts at obfuscation, so-called encryption. So I guess the one thing I have to debuff here is that software cannot be encrypted. There is one exception to that of sorts, which is uh, on iOS, and that is when you deploy an IPA through the App Store, that IPA is in fact encrypted. Apple has a very, very strong mechanism called uh, text encryptor, which is based on the technique that was originally called fair play that back in the day they thought would be used for MP3s. Uh, that never worked out, not too well, because people didn't want their DRM, but then they realized they've got this DRM and they can apply it on software, which is exactly what they do. So when you download IPAs, uh, like not that IPA that you're drinking here, the other IPAs, uh, then those are basically encrypted, and they're encrypted in the way that can only be opened on the device itself. That could potentially be a problem, but that's exactly why we jailbreak. When we jailbreak, we get the ability to run as root, we get the ability to access all the task ports, we can take any any process and we can just dump its contents and then of course get any of its encrypted or so-called content. Uh, another thing that in absence of encryption we normally see is that the malware would not normally go and go use a static import table, but rather they'd use DL open or any of the higher level variants. Uh, um, in Linux there aren't too many, but in uh, Mac OS, iOS there's all sorts of NS bundle and all sorts of NS plug and load, that kind of stuff. And that's basically boiling down to DL open. And in those cases, then, uh, you know, your, your static analysis would run into problems because in many ways these would be like dynamic loading of libraries and getting the procedure addresses, which is what you do in Windows with load library get proc address. So here you do it in DL open, DL sim and variants. So that's, again, a challenge. Now if we go to dynamic analysis, so I was saying, we can't go into this discussion without realizing there's some serious risks. Um, the main risk is that if you're doing this in an emulated environment, as Alex so carefully demonstrated here, there are issues and obviously the malware could potentially find that you're trying to analyze it and then just basically play nice. Like, you know, if, uh, if you've got emulation, then just exit. Uh, that's one thing, but then, to this, I would say, just run it without VM, just run it on real machine, and then that likelihood is increased, is, is like basically decreases to nothing. Uh, the binary may thwart the passive inspection or the intrusive inspection, and to do so, they would usually try to detect if there's any type of debugger present or any type of attachment. And I say here attachment in the sense of, you know, it could be debugger, it could be a ptrace API, it could be any type of other foreign process that's trying to mess with my memory. Uh, the main approach of that is to, uh, since the, the main interface would be over the ptrace APIs, it would be in the Mac OS and iOS case, it would be to do a ptrace pt deny attach. And in the Linux case, it would be something like attached to yourself. So you attach to yourself, you're like your own debugger, and because you're already attached, nobody else can attach to you. Uh, these are very, very rudimentary techniques, and they can easily be bypassed or you know, detected, where either during the static analysis st stage, you see that there is a uh, call out to ptrace, which automatically tells you that they're doing anti-debugging, or in other cases, you actually single step in the debugger, because from the moment the binary loads, 
it's not the entry point of the binary that gets loaded. It's actually the dynamic loader, which is in Linux or Android LD, and in uh, Mac OS iOS, it's DYLD, both of which actually get the control first. So there it is to attach, and if you're doing it with uh, LLDB, for example, you got process launch minus S, where the minus S says, start up the process, but don't actually transfer control to it. From that point on, you'd single step, and then it's a simple matter of finding where that call to ptrace is. Uh, in most cases, because malware realizes that you'd be looking for ptrace, what they do is something pretty conniving, which is to jump into the import table directly and actually jump to some random other syscall, which is an instruction like SVC or syscall from user mode, and they just load the register. Uh, with some other value, namely the syscall instruction for ptrace would be uh, value number 26. And in doing so, they kind of get by that. But if you can find where they call syscall directly, it's a simple matter to either knop it out in the binary or potentially just if you're an LDB, jump over it by reg write PC, and they're basically done. However, that still leaves another problem, which is probably the most important problem, which is why people use emulators in the first place. And that is that if you let it run free, it might actually run too free and might end up compromising you. Uh, to this, I would say that's a totally different academical philosophical discussion of how to set up a proper uh, gated community, so to speak, where you're running it on a box, but that box has like emulated not so much the system, but the network so that it can still do its TCP IP connectivity, but it's under heavy scrutiny, and it's, of course, firewalled out, and there's some type of uh, network bandwidth policing and whatnot. So given that, and given that we're realizing that for our discussion there's dynamic analysis, let's talk about what we monitor. Generally, the old adage says that if it happens inside the process, it stays inside the process. And so I'm drawing a line here and not really talking too much about the invasive stuff, namely invasive as in inspecting process memory, messing with process memory, doing that kind of stuff. Uh, so I'm stopping shy of code injection, and you'll see that as a footnote in the slides, because I had to make sure, because eventually, if you're, if you're looking for the best way for dynamic analysis, surely code injection is, is probably right there in the top. Uh, there's all sorts of code injection frameworks, uh, you know, there's Frida, there's a bunch of others, and they all will probably tell themselves being so amazing and all that, so that's a different discussion. Uh, I will tell you that the whole point of this example is to show you how you can avoid that and not go to that point. And in which case, you're limiting your scope of discussion to only those, um, I would say, foreign object, those that exist outside the process, and those that are system-wide. And those would be primarily files and or the file system activity. This would be any type of hardware access, which for the most part in Unix-based systems is usually opening up some type of dev node if you're on Linux, but in macOS could also be via IOKit calls, which you do not see as a file system presence. And last but not least, network sockets, because we're under the assumption that our malware of choice, or any software for that matter, will eventually want to phone home and say how cozy a home it's found and how it would like to bring more malware in. So. We talk about the techniques. Now, the techniques themselves also, there's quite a gamut here that ranges from the snapshot-based or polling-based, wherein you periodically sample the malware. You let it run, but you periodically sample it at little points. Uh, this is not so much out of choice, but out of no choice, because as you'll see, Linux doesn't have very good notification-based mechanisms. So you're basically stuck at this periodic polling. The good news is that Linux has unbelievable polling mechanisms, all courtesy of the proc file system. Uh, but then you have a problem there, which is if you poll incorrectly or if you poll like too infrequently, you might end up missing some serious critical events. And that could be a huge, huge, huge problem. Therefore, most of the approaches will go to continuous process monitoring. And continuous means that you run the program and then you either somehow attach to the process or you do a system-wide process monitoring, but you single out that particular process of malware, that collection of threads, and thereby also following any forks in, in case that malware is like a multi-process binary or something like that. And that leads us to the generic system-wide, which is always a good idea. Uh, generic system-wide monitoring is when you're not actually looking at this or that process. You're looking at all the APIs, by all the processes, by all the threads at a given time, and what you're trying to achieve is a baseline of the system to see how it behaves normally, versus how it may behave, shall we say, erratically or abnormally, call it what you will. So uh, again, we've got some approaches here. N I'm not saying which one is the best because usually it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, in the case of uh, snapshots, as I said, that's actually the easiest. Uh, there are a variety of tools that let you do that. Uh, some of them, like for example, in macOS, you've got sample. 
uh, sample is a small binary that's actually well documented. And what it does is it just attaches periodically and samples every process for so-and-so times in like so-and-so seconds. Usually it's like, uh, I think, one millisecond over a span of 10 seconds. And that gets you basically a stack trace and you can see roughly what the process is doing. Then there are the more Unix standard commands like LSOF, which is list open files. And list open files is, you know, something that you've probably seen also in uh, Linux or wherever because it iterates over all the processes and over the op all the open inodes. And in this context, inode could also mean devices and sockets, and it just basically dumps them all out. Uh, there is a specific tool that I can tell you uh, I use a lot, and that is in, in Mac OS and in iOS, and I call it Process Explorer. Uh, said Process Explorer, I'll just demonstrate here very, very quickly, is um, pretty much a top replacement if you're looking at um, Mac OS, and it's pretty much the only tool you have on iOS because Apple never bothers to publish any tools for iOS. Uh, it has several ways uh, in, and methods in which you can invoke it. The main one is, of course, when you're doing it interactively, wherein it's like a top replacement. Oops, sorry. Uh, where is that? Yeah, over here. Uh, that's my VM, by the way, so I am emulating stuff. Uh, so as you can see, that's basically where you can see, um, you know, it's pretty much like top, and you can zoom in on a particular process, and you can see all sorts of, you know, what the process is doing. So it's pretty much like top in that sense, but it also has a command line where the command line is actually useful specifically for snapshots. So as you can see, it's got all sorts of options like uh, getting the core dump, getting the file descriptor, getting the Mach ports, XPC ports, uh, getting all the threads, getting all the regions, just to show you a quick example here, and of course I am, uh, I need to be root for this, so let me just quickly sudo bash. Uh, then I'll just show you over here, my prompt is messed up, uh, I'll just show you over here that uh, if I look for example at, I don't know, uh, say for example uh, this shell, and I want to look for example at its FDs, so it's a simple matter of looking at this. I could also do proc exp all FDs, where this is actually useful because it goes over every single process in the system, sampling it, telling you what FD it is, what, and if it's a socket, also where it's connected to. For example, user agent here, it's connected over a Unix domain socket to this particular socket or to a private run uh, syslog, and then if there's somebody on the other end, you actually know. Another thing you can do with this thing is you can do a regions that gets you like, uh, memory dump. This is very similar to the Mac OS VM map, uh, or if you will, in Linux, proc maps, which gives you like the same idea. But again, it works also on iOS. But uh, probably the best of all these is to look at either threads, like so, where you get a snapshot of exactly where the threads are. And mind you, these addresses by themselves are useless, so what you really want to do is you just want to get a core dump. And a core dump is something that, if you're familiar with Windows, Windows has in the task manager, I think as of um, seven, they have a generate core dump. Now, the Windows core dump is kind of like a, usually a mini dump, which doesn't really help you much. But observe here that I can just pick any process, and I can just say, give me the core. Now, this is going to take a while, because we're looking at the full virtual memory. And I'm not making any like discounts here and to say, oh yeah, that's a shared library or that's a shared cache. So I just, I won't take it. I take everything. And the reason why I take everything is because as you can see, we've got a full core dumped here. This is a TMP core one. And the file type is of course a core in which you can just run it into LLDB, LLDB minus C, or if you will, GDB minus C, same thing. And then get a perfect analysis of exactly at that snapshot where the process was, what it was doing, and you know what the memory image of it was. So that's a very, very useful feature. And I think, at least in my case, I use it uh, like very frequently in order to uh, do uh, reversing. Now, I don't actually reverse too much malware. Most of my reversing effort is based on um, specific either third-party uh, demons in Android or primarily I reverse iOS, like demon by demon for all my uh, book research. But again, this method could apply just as easily to pretty much anything. Now, in Linux, I was saying there's the proc PID. And I believe that a lot of people just don't realize what a pleasure a cornucopia of information you have from PROC. So uh, just to give you some idea, again, most of these things, if you want the full information, you would need probably to be root, but even not as root. Uh, you can do this on Linux, you can do this on Android. It's a simple matter of going to PROC, picking your you know, process of choice, let's say my shell again, because that's the easiest uh, target here. And as you do an LS, you'll see basically irrespective of which process, you'll see the same files. Now, none of these files exist, okay? That's DF 
shows you. None of these exist. These are actually pseudophiles. This is a pseudophile system. It's all a figment of the kernel's twisted imagination. However, the nice thing about it is that whereas normally when a file does not exist, it tells you e no end, no such file or directory, here it's going to say, mm, wait a sec, that rings a bell. I know what this file should be like. And then it's got a closed list of these file names, which vary in between kernel versions. And then it just runs a kernel handler for you. And that kernel handler populates that file for you. Or in the case of the files that you see here in blue, which are effectively symbolic links, you've got CWD, you've got XN, you've got root, which shows you exactly where the process is right now for the current working directory. Now, what I like about this thing is that, you know, the process in question, let me just zoom in a little bit so you can see, because I can't see my back. Yeah, it's kind of small. Uh, so the process in question has no freaking clue that you're doing this. There is no way to detect this. So again, if you're looking at it from the perspective of evasion or uh, you know anti-detection techniques, it's it just it's seriously it's not applicable. And uh, just to show you some idea, so I'm going to do ls minus l on proc dollar dollar cwd, which is my current working directory. Naturally, now it's showing me inside proc, but I can try to run. And wherever I go, it's not going to work. I mean, I can try to run, but I can't hide. See, wherever I go, every time I sample, it automatically updates this. Now, it's not really that it's updating or keeping some track, but rather when I call on this so-called CWD, it goes, where is the process right now? Goes to the kernel task struct. The kernel task struct is the definitive process control block. And then over there, there's like a pointer to whichever V node serves as my current working directory, and that is in fact what's reported. Now this is just a small, small fraction, because honestly, how much can you go with a CWD? The more interesting part is the FDs. And in the FDs, you can see that I've got my sim links, again, the same sim link emulation that shows me where I am and what I'm doing. Now, just to show you on the one hand how good this is, but also on the other hand how limited it is, is a simple example. I'll run find. And find is, you know, one of those things that tries to find stuff in your file system and goes crazy. It like goes over all your file system recursively and so forth. So what I'm going to do is I'm just picking some random name and I'm redirecting to devnull and I'm also redirecting the std out to devnull because what I care about really is just to watch the process in action. So I'll do this and I'll run it in the background. As I'll run it in the background, I'll get the PID. And that PID will give me the handle that I need in proc so I can do ls minus l and so. And proc 18662 FD. And you can see over here that as I run it every single time, I see in real time which files it's opening and what it's doing. Now again, it's not perfect, but it's as far as Linux will go and get you these snapshots. Oh, I just ran another find by mistake. Uh, it's uh, as far as Linux will go, and it's definitely, definitely a very potent ability if you know how to channel and how to use it. And the idea is, again, define how often you sample. Now, this could be used with additional uh, process control techniques. For example, killing minus stop the process, suspending the malware every now and then. Uh, kill minus stop is a uh, Unix signal that cannot be trapped. The malware does not know that you're stopping it, but it does not change its state in terms of which file descriptors are open, et cetera, et cetera, and therefore that makes it a very useful ability. So that's as far as proc goes. And again, I, I want to point out that there's a ton more in proc, and maybe just one thing that you know is, I think, pretty much the best thing here. Proc and whatever PID mem, uh, it looks like a file, it feels like a file, it is not a file. You open it programmatically, you L-seek to the address of your choice, and that's really reading process memory. You read from there, you've read the process memory. You write to there, you've written the process memory. So it's, and this is great because whereas ptrace can be denied, this cannot be denied. So you're not really actively attaching to the process, and therefore the process has no idea. All, the only thing it sees the next time it accesses the data is, oh, whoa, the data is different, wow. And it doesn't know that because it has no way to cache this data. So this is really, really powerful. And again, this is if you're going with a snapshot idea. Okay? However, due to the limitations, let's focus on what we do for monitoring. Uh, monitoring, unfortunately, I can't tell you too much in Linux because Linux is kind of bad. As I mentioned, uh, we have a lot of snapshotting. We do not have a notifying mechanism. Now, there is actually an iNotify, which you can see here, which is well documented in the man, section seven, if you ever feel bored and you want to read. And uh, it's unfortunately very limited, and I'll show you why. Uh, as an example, I think I have this. I actually I have this either for Linux or Android. I'm showing here it works in both uh, systems. 
Uh, I think I have some uh, I notify here somewhere. Uh, yes, I do. So this is a simple binary. It uses the iNotify uh, API. Long story short, if you're not going to read the man, and I know you're not going to read the man, uh, it's just basically you create an iNotify file descriptor. That's an iNotify in it that returns a file descriptor. And then on top of that, you do iNotify add watch. And you watch the directory in choice, uh, for example, Etsy. OK, now it's watching, and it's blocking on that directory. So you say, OK, that's cool. That will give me some you know, valuable information. You open up a new terminal, just so I can do this in two. Oh, and there you go, right there, see? You can see that all sorts of files in Etsy have been opened. Specifically, LDSO cache has been opened, and that's because processes are starting. And the LDSO cache gives you all the uh, you know, preloaded libraries and stuff like that. So this is uh, very nice on the one hand, but it lacks one very important thing, which for the life of me, since 269, they haven't added yet, and that is the actor. You don't know who done it. You know the file is accessed. That's already very, very useful, but eh, you don't know who done it. So if you're running the malware on its own, it's still better than nothing, because any access by the malware to any file you will see, because that file generates a VFS event. That VFS event gets narked to iNotify, so you get the notification. It's still a matter of figuring out who and what, but that could be joined with the snapshot technique, where remember that we can do the FDs and see which files are presently open. So that's a nice approach. If you're going to the other operating system, namely uh, Mac OS, this is where it's like brilliant. It is like utterly brilliant. In Mac OS, you've got out of the box, as of I believe 10.5, no, we don't need UVM, we need the other VM. Uh, so in Mac OS, you've got as of 10.5, um, um, we've got an amazing feature called DevFS events, which is also available in your uh, iOS. Now, Caveat, this needs root, or it needs to work with the um, uh, CFFS events API that they give you from uh, Core Foundation, actually from Core Services to be exact, and uh, that way you get it through a mediator. That mediator is this guy called, surprisingly, FS events D, and uh, again, you lose the actor information. So I'm not entirely clear why Apple does allow it as non-root, but then you lose the actor information, and we really need to know the actor. So I have my own tool here, uh, which is called Filemon. And if the name rings a bell, where is Filemon? If the name rings a bell, it's because uh, it's homage to Mark Rusinovich's immortal tool. And a lot of my tools that I do for macOS are essentially the equivalent of sysinternals, uh, but for macOS and iOS, and no GUI. And there is a reason for that. The only proper way to write GUI in macOS and iOS is Objective-C, and I refuse to go into Objective-C, okay? I will not do it, okay? Now, there is a Swift thing, but eh, I'm kind of weighing that. No, I'm, I still, I'm, I'm fine with the command line. The advantage of that, by the way, is all the tools are SSHable. So let's just show you uh, Filemon, which is here. Uh, Filemon with no argue, well, actually, I want to do the a help message. This is Filemon with a help message. Um, with no argument, it just starts monitoring. And if it's root, it monitors the full info. If it's not root, it just goes through FS events D, so you lose a little bit of information. Uh, the nice thing about this is uh, you can see it in Technicolor, and that's super useful, because then you let the system run like so, and let's do, let's touch some file here. Touch slash, uh, you know, TMP, uh, wow. Okay, and you can see that right here, it's shown right here that I created this private TMP, wow. Now this is, again, the same as I notify when you think about it, but then there is this, as you can see over here, the PID. Now in this case, by the way, there is a certain race condition that the PID, the notification got to me after the PID had exited. So that's why it says 70, uh, 1757 instead with no ID. But if the PID is still alive, for example, the terminal, you can see as it goes and what it does as it does it. Okay, so that's a really, really useful API. Uh, one or two things I added to this tool is the ability to auto hard link on files and to auto stop processes. Now, both of these I should point out are race conditions because by the time I would get the notification, it could be that the process has moved on, obviously. So there is a certain race condition here. But it, for the most part, I've seen that as you open a file, it takes you a while when you write to it before you remove it if it's a temporary file. If I can put a hard link automatically to that file, then you remove it, but the file's not gone. Because the file's only gone when the last link to the inode gets removed. So if I can capture this hard link and I can keep it in a separate directory, which the tool does, I get all the temporary files. The other thing is that this ability that you can see here with a minus S to stop, and that automatically on a filter that you would specify triggers a kill minus stop. 
and freezes that little bastard. So again, certain race condition, but you know that within a couple of whatever, however many function calls, you will stop the malware in question. Then it gives you time to pause and reflect and think about like, how do we get here? What is it trying to do? And so forth. So that's this uh, FileMon thing. And you know, it's freely available and so forth off of the website. And it also is um, available again for Mac OS, iOS, TV OS, and even watch OS. I've had people run it on watch. Now, in terms of network monitoring, once again, if you're in Linux and Android, mm, I don't know what I can say here. Let's move along and let's talk about some serious operating systems like Darwin, where we happen to have a proprietary interface which is unbelievable, and it's called Com Apple Network Statistics. Uh, this runs in an address family of 32, which Linux people won't recognize because it doesn't exist. Uh, it's Darwin specific, and it's called PF system. So it's a system socket. Now, system sockets by themselves, we could talk about like for days because there's so many features that you can do with system sockets, such as you know user mode tunneling, and you can do all sorts of control over the kernel. But in this particular case, we're looking at Com Apple Network Statistics. Com Apple Network Statistics is what Activity Monitor uses to get the network statistics, and therefore it's a private API, and yet. It's available, it's just a matter of reversing. Uh, this API, uh, as far as I know, has only seen the light of day in my first edition book back then, but that was for 10.7, and now we have 10.12, and every single time Apple modifies it, thereby breaking compatibility with their own tools, but basically they're adding more and more and more features. Now the Apple tool to do this is called NetTop, and it's out of the box. Uh, however, how shall we say it's not really too um, friendly, or maybe it's friendly to people in Cupertino. It wasn't friendly to me. I don't know. Just the NetTop thing is like really, really hard. So uh, I'd like to offer an alternative. NetTop is closed source, and so I basically wrote an open source alternative, which is called LSOC. The pun being, of course, like LSOF, but for sockets. And uh, the way it would work, it, again, it runs in several ways where you can see only TCP, only UDP, do it once, do it with no curses, do it with curses. Uh, if you do it LSOC once, it looks exactly like Netstat. Okay, like so, where it's telling you the TCP connections, and of course the peers and also the IDs of whoever the uh, communicating uh, process is. And then if you run it in uh, full curses mode, it becomes like uh, basically your network monitor. If you run it in no curses mode and not once, it becomes a history. And then every single socket connectivity, UDP, TCP, whatever, it picks up. And just to demonstrate this, uh, oh wait, what's the Wi-Fi password here? Why am I not connected to Wi-Fi? Wait, uh, you know what, you know what, let's just open a new terminal, and let's just do, I don't know, uh, Telnet localhost uh, 631 is a good port, and you should be able to see it right here. See, that's a Telnet localhost 631. You actually see both ends, because it's localhost. So you see CUPSD, which is the internet printing server, and then you see my Telnet going. And of course, if I'll disconnect here, then it'll disconnect here. I mean, the nicer thing about it is when you do it like with Safari, and then like, pfft, you get like a gazillion ports out there. So this is like extremely useful. And again, the idea is that to run it uh, out of all its, uh, this is a debug version, which is why you're seeing refreshing. But uh, the idea is to run it with uh, the no curses. And then no curses means like it just basically doesn't do full screen. And it can log every single socket, every single network activity, which of course is very useful if you're trying to figure out you know, exactly what happened. Again, no comparison to Linux here because Linux does not have this. They do have Netlink. But Netlink notifications are not tied to sockets for whatever reason. Uh, what can we do then in Linux? So Linux has probably one of the best tools for, I would say, semi-invasive monitoring. And semi-invasive in this sense means that you have to attach with ptrace. So it can be denied and it potentially could be detected. But on the flip side, if you're willing to go long term with your attachments and you know it's not just a fling, then you can definitely go and like see everything, and I mean everything that the process does. Uh, are we guys familiar with S-Trace, Linux people here? Okay, I'm seeing some yes, some no. So just as a simple example of S-Trace, this is like honestly one of the best tools. Uh, it's a simple matter of just looking for example here. Uh, I'll put uh, two windows up. Uh, one of them is gonna be the tracer, the other is gonna be the tracee. Uh, I'm gonna put the tracer here, and I'm actually going to be um, 
root here, just so I can show you this, because again, I need ptrace activity here. So echo dollar dollar to get my shell, and then strace minus p on this 181817. Again, I'm demonstrating this on a shell because it's just easy, but it could be done on any process. Minus p, as you can see, attaches to a process when it's live. And observe that I can just press any letter I want here, and I can see it right here. Now this is like bloody awesome, because let me just show you another example, which is, let's say, let's say that we've got SSHD, right? Now you know SSHD is like, you know, super encrypted and whatnot, yeah, whatever. So this is SSHD, it's running here, and I'm going to now SSH to myself, okay? Uh, you know, sometimes I do that, it's always nice to talk to yourself. So um, what I'll do here is PS minus F grep SSH. Here's my SSH Morpheus at localhost, which is 189075. Again, assuming I have the permission to do this, which I do, I do this, and then I'll type in my super secret password. And uh, yeah, that super secret password, yeah? That's right here. Okay, now you actually do see how it gets sent in, um, like if it would go over SSH, you actually do see how it gets sent over the wire, which is some garbled crypto mumbo jumbo like Ace256 or Blowfish or Twofish or any other type of fish, who cares, right? Because what you get here is you get the actual plain text data because eventually this has to be read to a terminal, it has to be you know, written to a terminal, written to a file, I don't know, wherever, it's gotta be plain text. So you get that and it's pretty awesome. Now I should point out that there is also an L trace, which is a library trace. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that actually because it's like the signal to noise ratio is like phew, terrible. L trace it does library calls. The only way you can do library calls really if you think about it is to single step the process, look at the instruction pointer, see when the instruction pointer crosses a segment boundary, see if that segment is now a dilib or an SO in our case, and uh, whatever, and then try to reverse engineer all, uh, dynamically all of the you know, arguments. And this is terrible because the um, performance factor, I've seen it run as bad as 100 times slower, which is like crazy. Now it turns out that both strace and strace are very good, but they've got some problems. The main problem being is that they can't block and they're pretty much rigid. I mean, strace you could see is very nice because it recognizes system calls and all that, but we need more. And so I'd like to offer uh, something that I originally wrote for Android. And I wrote this for Android because at the time there was no S trace for ARM64. And I'm a big ARM64 buff. I love ARM64. It's like, I think, coolest assembly and coolest architecture out there. So just to show you what this is, I'll open up this time two ADB shells. And of course, one of them I'll root myself. And ADB shell over here. And uh, again, the basic style, if you will, of JTrace is like super simple, where it does the same thing as S trace. But two things about it. One, it is Android aware. And two, it is actually also pluggable, as in extensible, and I'll tell you that in a, in a minute. So just to give you some example here, um, what's a quick example that's colorful enough? Screen cap, probably. Okay, so I'll do screen cap. Screen cap is something that captures the screen. Okay, so as the name implies. How it captures the screen is an entirely different discussion. So I'm gonna have to do this in two windows. Uh, which means, because I want to show you like the, my output versus the screen cap. The screen cap is just going to be junk, but the point is that I'm going to have to do this and I'm going to have to get that process before it starts. So a little trick I've learned over the years is to run it in the background and immediately stop it with a percent one. Now this is again a race condition because it's going to run in the background, but let's see, what does it take longer to start up the process or to go immediately and do a built-in kill command? I guess probably the kill command always works. So now you can see that it's stopped. And then what I can do is I can do a data local TMP uh, JTrace. I probably want to do it in color, because I love colors. And uh, then I can do minus P on 16.3.5.4. I actually also probably want to do minus O to capture the output to a file, which being here can only be in data local TMP because it's an Android device. So here's my uh, four X's, whatever. Uh, and then you can see that this released the screen cap over here. And now as you can see over here, I've got the capture complete. Now if I go over this capture and I just look at uh, cat data local TMP XXX, this is gonna be very verbose and very like full of you know, methods like mmap and everything. But specifically what I want to demonstrate is in the case of Android, everything is done through something called binder, which is 
an abomination. That's a different discussion to have, okay? But long story short, it's the, it's the only thing we have for IPC. So I just wanna show how I can do a grep method, and that shows you the exact binder methods. It shows you that in order to capture the screen, first you'd go up and check a service, an XPC service called, like in this case, Surface Flinger, and then you'd go through Surface Composer, which is its Java-style interface as if, and then you just go and say, get built-in display, get configs, create the graphics buffer, capture the screen, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a pretty useful way where you've got this tool that is more aware of the underlying uh, APIs which are specific and idiosyncratic to Android rather than those of Linux. Although the tool does also run on Linux because it's using the same API. However, the main thing about this tool is not all the Android awareness, it's probably the plugins. Uh, I'm running low on time so I can't really show you the plugins, but I will tell you that these are all documented. So in newandrewbooks.com, uh, that's the, my Android internals book, you've got uh, jtrace.html, and I'm not connected to the internet, okay. Now I have to connect to the internet. Uh, what is the, uh, okay, where, wait, where's my Wi-Fi thingy? Oh wow, look at that, my Wi-Fi thingy disappeared. Yeah, no, I mean, it's supposed to be, yeah, no, I know preference. Oh, there we go, wow. That, holy smokes, see, that, nev that never happened to me, that just launching preferences automatically starts the uh, little status bar. Anyway, turn Wi-Fi on and then, um, okay, there you go. Um, wow, okay, that was, you learn something new every day. Uh, anyway, so new Android book, JTrace, and I'm still not connected, apparently. Yeah, it's trying to, okay, there you go. And so this JTrace thing, uh, again, it's a, it's a closed source tool, but it's free. And it works on Linux and it works on Android. And the main thing with this plugins is, as you can see, is that I give you an API. Now, this API is intentionally architecture agnostic because you could be running the tool on ARM, on ARM v7, you could be running it on Intel, for all I know. So the way it works, and I'll try to zoom in a little bit, you can see over here that uh, you've got the registers as codes that abstract the calling convention. You get the first arc, second arc, third arc, and you don't necessarily know if it's RDI, RSI, RDX, RCX, or if it's X0123, or if it's R0123, whatever. And then all you really need to do is register your syscall handler as a callback. So as an example, if you, if you go in this page and you look a little bit higher, there's like this simple example. You do a dilib or an SO in our case, uh, and then you just may say re register syscall handler. You say which syscall you want. Okay, now that too is not trivial because for some bizarre reason, the syscall numbers change in between versions of Linux. God, God knows why, you know? You'd think ARM64 and, and uh, Intel64 would have the same syscall set, they don't. But anyway, so you just say write, for example, and then you say here's my handler. You specify if your handler needs to be called on exit or an entry or on both, as well as some miscellaneous flags that nobody cares about, and this is what it would look like. Whenever that write or read or whatever it is you're registering for has occurred, I call you back. I call you back and then you can basically specify, okay, here's uh, my handler, right? And in the handler, you can say, I want the registers. I want to know if I've been called on exit or entry and I want to call which PID I was tracing. And doing that, you can also do read process memory and write process memory, which again are abstractions over if it's ptrace or process vm read v or if it's proc mem. I use any of these techniques and that gives you a great ability to basically intercept calls and do all sorts of malformations and the main thing is without any code injection. There's no code injection. What you're doing is you're basically doing data injection by hooking these uh, methods. So uh, it's a pretty useful tool and I use it on Android like pretty much all the time. So that's for that. Uh, for macOS iOS, uh, there isn't an equivalent because the equivalent unfortunately, thanks to our friends at Cupertino, needs a bloody entitlement. Uh, and they, they, they just ruin every good thing with entitlements, that's how they do things. It's like, oh, we have a security issue. Let's create an entitlement for it. Uh, wait, is this being videoed after all? Okay, uh, yeah, okay, anyways. But I just wanna show you one unknown or little known trick, which is that you can easily harness one of Mac OS's and iOS's probably most amazing features, the sandbox for uh, tracing your malware. And I'm not saying here to quarantine anything, I'm just saying run it with a permissive profile and think about it like in SE Linux parlance, like only generating AVCs not actually doing anything, and I'll show you just how simple it is. Uh, it's a simple matter of doing a TMP trace SB, which I think maybe I have, yeah I do, and then just saying version one, because since 10.5 till 10.12 it's still version one, and then just put the tracing file that you want, and then sandbox exec minus F on this TMP trace SB, 
uh, let me just make sure I don't have my tracing file. Yeah, I'll remove this. So sandbox exec minus F TMP trace SB, and then your malware in question, or you know, for lack of a malware sample, bin LS. Bin LS will run the same way, but now observe that TMP tracing out has been formed and gives me every single thing, every system call, plus the arguments that friend LS here did. Okay, so that's a super, super useful tool uh, for uh, Mac OS, and I will point out that Technically, it's easy to detect if you're inside the malware. Uh, you could basically call uh, undocumented uh, system calls around the 380 area, uh, like Mac exec VE, and uh, you've got also Mac syscall, and you can detect if you're sandbox in this way. But still, honestly, most developers don't even know that it exists. So how would they possibly conceivably try to, to test that they've been quarantined? So that's what you would do in uh, Mac OS iOS. Now, if you're willing to go invasive, this opens up whew, an entire gamut of like all sorts of stuff. Uh, primarily, again, I'm not going to talk too much about code injection. I'll just say that Linux Android has something called LD preload, and uh, Mac OS iOS has DYLD insert libraries, both of which do require one important uh, proviso, which is that you have control over the environment a priori. As in, you either have uh, the shell script that launches it or the plist that launches it. And in the Mac OS case, nowadays you also have that it's not a restricted binary or not like an entitled binary is more accurate because restricted you can get past. And so uh, in those cases, this enables you to do any type of hooking you want in a very simple matter by basically just interposing. Uh, and I've actually demonstrated uh, that uh, several times by now, so I'm just gonna show you the source which is pretty self-explanatory, uh, you would go to, where is the source? Uh, yeah, see my problem is I name my sources like L.C, B.C, and then it's hard to find. But anyways, this is what it would look like. You would see here that you get an interpose structure. The interpose structure you define at the end for the interpose libraries, like my open is open, my connect is connect, uh, and so forth. So here's my connect where you can see that it says connect on a system socket, or open this file, or open that file. All it would take from that point is to just do a DYLD insert library, start it, and then you'll see every single, in this case, connection or open, where connect is a TCP uh, session establishment, and open would be like opening a file or something. Uh, incredibly simple, the way it would work is that the library in question, uh, which you'd compile shared minus OL dilib, uh, the library in question, oh yeah, LL dilib, I last compiled this is root apparently, uh, so the last uh, right here, you'll see that if you do a JTool minus L on it, you'll see that it has a special section which is called data interpose, and this gives you the mapping of your functions to the actual um, uh, original functions that would be overlaid. Uh, and another little known feature of DYLD and Mac OS is that this can actually be done dynamically, as in it can be done also once the process is alive, if you properly inject your library. So that's a very useful thing. There's like the source here, for example. I would have gone with the demo, but it's a little bit longer than that. Uh, and so I'll just conclude with system-wide activity monitoring where at least Linux is on par. So for system-wide activity, again, remember we're not focusing on a particular process, we're just trying to look at a overall broad view of what the system is doing. So there's a lot of traces here. We've already seen like there's a P trace, now I'm telling you there's an F trace and there's a D trace. Uh, apparently people who write tracing tools aren't that original with their names. Uh, Mac OS also has another thing which is called KDebug, which I believe is God's greatest gift to humanity short of D trace. So how would that work? Uh, looking at Linux and Android, uh, I'll just do it on the actual, um, on the actual host here, not on the device. Uh, so the idea is that, first of all, you gotta be root, it's always root, and then you'd go to syskernel debug. Now syskernel debug is this wonderful section of the uh, sys file system, which is effectively a different file system called debugfs. It's got all sorts of plentiful stuff, a lot of information, uh, a lot of KSLR leaks, by the way, if you're looking for that kind of stuff. But anyways, so you get there and there's a specific directory called tracing. And tracing is the ftrace functionality. Now I'll tell you one thing about this. I'm not here to show you the whole thing. And, and if the kernel is willing to sacrifice two whole pages of memory so as to provide you with a pseudo file of readme, maybe you should read it. And I say that because I keep telling that to people when, you know, in our trainings and stuff, and they never read. 
they totally never read. If you don't use it the right way, it can panic your kernel. So that's why they say, please read me. And that is the read me over here. That basically gives you the nutshell of how to use this mechanism and so forth. The true power of this mechanism is out of our scope. And that's actually for kernel level tracing. And you can see pretty much every single thing, every single function in the kernel, be it exported or not. It is unbelievably powerful. But if you're going to analyze user mode, so one would ask, why do I need kernel for user? And the answer is, if you're sitting at the kernel level, any user, any PID, any UID, you get to see. So in this case, there is a subdirectory called events. And in events, you can see that there is various subsystems here. So subsystems like the block system, like the ext2 file system, like ext, well, in this case, ext4, uh, like the IP stack, like the various types of uh, generic sockets. And case in point, the ones that I use most are either syscalls or the uh, raw syscalls, which you have over here. Raw syscalls are lightweight, and they just tell you a system call occurred and dump the arguments at you, whereas a syscall actually tries to resolve what the syscall is and maybe, maybe make sense of the arguments. So just to show you how you do that, it's super easy. You'd go to syscalls, you'd get a rundown of every single system call. Now this is insane because you can actually say, I want to enable this on all system calls, where you just end up with like, plentiful debug data and signal to noise ratio would be very bad. However, what you could do is you can say, I only want to do, for example, open, and I only want to do it on sys enter of open. So you do this, and you know what? Maybe I also want to do it on sys exit of open. So basically, you're signaling out this particular set or subset of system calls that is of interest to you. And again, this could be open, connect, whatever, whatever. And then you go to the main of uh, tracing, and you just say echo one into tracing on. And honestly, it's as simple as that. Now, you see there's no noticeable effect, but if you look at trace, you'll see that in the interim, every single open in the system by any process, VM tools D in this case, or CAD or whatever, is recorded. So it's recorded, and you get like the full information on it, which is you know pretty amazing, because any such system call can be triggered in this way. You also see the return value. This was FD7, for example. So that's a super, super useful thing. And it's undocumented. And again, the uh, malware in question does not know you're doing this. And so if you ostensibly did it with a filter only for that PID, you'd get a full rundown of what the malware is doing at the system call level. Now, mind you, it's not library calls. There are limitations. But for the most part, if it's going to do anything interesting, if it's going to access a file, access a socket, do some hardware trick, or whatever, it's going to have to go through a system call, so you know that. Uh, for D-Trace, D-Trace is an unbelievable facility which uh, was basically scavenged off of the remains of Solaris. Uh, if anybody remembers Solaris, while it was in its death throes, um, you know, scavengers came from all over the world and tried to, like, you know, take little pieces and morsels. FreeBSD led, and they took BSM, and they took MacF, and they took DTrace, and then macOS kind of said, ooh, if uh, FreeBSD is doing it, obviously we can do it because we're part BSD. So now we have this unbelievable mechanism, which Apple has consistently tried to cripple and trying to, you know, keep it, like, Worse and worse, really, but it's still very useful. Um, now, again, DTrace by itself would be like an hour or two, but the Cliff Notes version is that it gives you a device, Dev DevTtrace, and on top of that, a complete language called D, which is the next step after C. That's why they call it D. And it's kind of like actually a hybrid between C and awk. And if you don't know what awk is, uh, Ignorance is bliss. So basically, basically, the idea is that this D-Trace is just giving you a set of probes. There's a great book by Brendan Gregg, who's, I think, one of the authors of D-Trace, as far as I know, uh, who uh, discusses how to use these things. And it's pretty expensive, but it gives you effectively the same functionality I showed you with JTrace, which is you can write your own language. You can write your own plugins. You can write your own probes. Just a simple case here. Uh, for example, here, dtrace minus n for an expression, syscall entry, printf, the PID and the exec name. So for every single syscall, this shows you what the system call was and who exited it. So let's just try this very quickly. I'll do a pseudo on this, like so. And uh, what's my password? Uh-huh. And so you can, wait, no, that doesn't make sense. Hold on, dtrace minus n syscall. Actually, let's do pseudo bash here. Oh, yeah, no, so, sorry, it says system integrity protection is on, yeah. So as you can see, uh, they're trying to ruin it with SIP. Uh, let's just do it, I'll actually do it in the, um, uh, where's my other VM, yeah. 
I hate my demo, since SIP, like Apple totally destroyed all the good debugging f functionality. But um, I'll give you just uh, some example. I'll give you actually the second one, which is just to look at, say, for example, open calls, which is this one. So dtrace minus n, and then notice that the way the probes are specified is like a provider, which is syscall, wild cards, which is leaving everything empty, and then entry or exit. So kind of similar to the, um, to the thing you saw with ftrace or gtrace. Uh, let me just do here an ID. Okay, yeah, so uh, dtrace minus n, and so syscall, and then this is basically saying the provider, and I'm saying whichever module, open. Now when I do open star, I'm basically saying open, open at, uh, open no cancel, it's all sorts of variants, and then entry. And then here's where the uh, aux syntax comes into play. You're basically getting these curly braces, where in these curly braces you can say what do you want to do. So you're calling printf here, where that's the same printf that you know and love, or not so love, really, from C. And then you can see here, percent %s, percent %s, with exec name, that's gonna be the built-in name of the uh, executable that you're probing, and copy instr, which is a built-in directive that copies from that process's address space to yours, so you can actually see what the argument was. So just to show you here, that'll be exec name, and then, uh, sorry, percent %s first. So here's percent %s, percent S, like so, and so we're doing here the exec name and the copy instr of the arg0. Now when I say here arg0, said arg0 is defined automatically inside the uh, dtrace language. So you can see arg0, r1, you don't have to worry about arguments being in whichever registers. Uh, when you do this, this will match whatever probes, and uh, da da da, wait, what is this? Hold on, why doesn't it wanna work? Give me a second, syntax error. I'm missing, I'm missing a parenthesis. I'm missing a parenthesis, sorry about that. Okay, so it's trying to actually do this, and then you can see match seven probes, and uh, if I'll do something like, uh, you know, whatever, this should automatically be caught here. So open, and notice every single process, 157, for example, is MD worker. It opened this file, it did this. So again, it's the same functionality that you would get with uh, anything uh, like uh, ftrace, but this is built into macOS and scriptable to an extent. Uh, last, but I would say not least, we've got kdebug. And this is uh, an amazing piece of work by Apple, which is probably gonna go away, just like every good thing, uh, because they're gonna probably slap an entitlement on us. Uh, kdebug is the basis for Apple's own tools, like FS usage, which is file system utilization and, uh, and API calls, super useful, or SE usage for system calls, or latency, or even the generic trace facility that they have. Uh, I wrote my own little tool on this, which is open source, which I call kdebug view, and this will work even in a SIP environment. Now, again, little star here, because Mac OS 10.13 is coming, and it's probably not gonna work anymore, which sucks, but whatever. So I'll go here to documents, uh, wherever I put that, kdebug, and so this is simple binary that works pretty much everywhere, also in iOS, Mac OS, where dtrace uh, is not available in, the, in iOS. So you can see kdv, buy a PID, and then all, uh, if you want all of them, with potentially filters and whatnot. And if you just run it with all, you're gonna get a fire hose of information. And I mean like a fire hose of information. You can see it's like spitting out everything. And if I were to just control C here, you'll see that the granularity of this thing is maybe a little bit too much, in the sense that you're seeing actually scheduling events, you're seeing interrupts. Every little thing that the kernel does, if it's so much as so, you know, like uh, does a context switch, you'll see it at that level. Uh, there's two ways of doing the filtering. You either do that from the command line, or my preference is, of course, use friend grep, and then BSC will get you all the system calls, and once again, you can see that you see, for example, here the terminal red, the terminal did an ioctal, you know which ioctal it is, you know which arguments to the ioctal it is, and so forth. So uh, this is something that is presently still working. You do need root privileges for. You might be surprised at the number of kernel addresses that pop up at you from time to time there. Uh, again, fun, fun fact. But uh, you know, I, I would say use it while you can because eventually it's gonna go away. Apple uses this extensively. Apple also has an instruments, if you know their amazing tool, where in um, Mac OS uh, instruments would use dtrace, but in iOS there is no dtrace, so they use this instead. They use something called iProfiler as their little um, engine. They run it on the device using the developer tools, and from that point on, you can get virtually everything the device is doing on every process, on every thread, including the kernel proper. 
So that's all I have time for. I'm actually three minutes behind. Any questions on this? Yes, please. Uh, not questions on this particularly, but uh, when are you releasing volume one and volume two? Haha, <laughs> okay, wow. So I have an avid reader here. Uh, okay, yeah, let me just say that, so volume three is thankfully out. That took forever. And I also pledge to maintain volume three, uh, you know, when iOS 11 comes out, if there's anything major. Volume one, amen, oh, amen, oh, I'm hoping here, I'm hoping, is going to be uh, probably July. Volume two, realistically, I'd want to see the sources of this new whichever next version. I'm guessing 4100 or 4200. When they come out, I'll probably do a little bit of uh, amendments that I would need for uh, volume two because it's the kernel internals. And hopefully, they'll both be out by the end of the year. Uh, I'd just like to point out, while I'm here, since he did ask the question, that was a volet, uh, that seriously, I'm just one person, I do these tools, I do these talks, I do the books, and seriously, it's like, it's, serious, it's, it's hard being me. It's hard being me. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm basically, no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like, uh, tomorrow I'm, I'm flying to Australia already, I'm like in, in town for like exactly like one and a half days for this, so, yeah. Uh, any other tracing related questions? Yes. In, in JTrace, yes. In JTrace, absolutely. There is a JTrace minus F. I mean, seriously, if Strace can do it, why can I not do it? Yeah. So JTrace and, F and Strace are drop and compatible. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. And that's exactly why in your register syscall handler, you've got an option to follow forks. And that's why I give you the PID. So you know if it's the main or if it's some child. And in this context, a child process in Linux is either a process or a thread because pthread create and fork both go to clone anyways. So who cares? It's just by the flags, I can tell you if it's a clone new thread or if it's a clone and uh, like a clear TID, then I know if it's a child process or if it's child thread, but yeah, totally. But again, the main thing about JTrace while we're talking about it is that it's a plug-in architecture. It's robust enough to do what it does, and then if you want to extend it, be my guest. And I, the plugins originally were, were not like my, my original idea, but then I realized in order to allow for Android, especially the binder methods, you need something called AIDL. Those unfortunately change every single version and sometimes in between preview releases. So the only way to get around that is to create your own plugins, register the plugins. Uh, future versions are going to have like an automatic plugin directory. So just like you've got lib hardware that shows you modules, you'd have like plugins that would be auto-detected by the version of Android and by the version of the architecture, and you'd be able to do that. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, how, how many of these tools are available to FreeBSD? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so with diagnostic tools, basically my tools that I write, I write in POSIX C, so they should be portable. The only thing is that when it comes to diagnostics, they often rely, for example, Process Explorer on very, very specific internal APIs, in which case I can't tell you. Um, to be honest, I'm probably going to be booed and uh, jeered here, but the last FreeBSD I used was like FreeBSD 6. Yeah, notice, notice the dramatic effect. Notice the dramatic, uh, dramatic effect. I think they either cut it or like my, my screen hibernated, but it's like perfect timing. Okay, any other questions? Yes? Yeah, absolutely. So, if you, who should I follow next on Twitter or? I have no idea. The only reason I'm on Twitter is because I was dragged there against my will. So I don't do this social media thingy, majiggy, whatever. Yeah, okay. Uh, of course, you could always come to our trainings, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. That's what we do. Yeah, I, I didn't even present the company. I suck at marketing. Anyways, uh, any other questions? Okay, so we're good. All right. Peace.